Good afternoon, folks. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to be allowing a few seconds for folks to flood into the virtual room as we are about to get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. You are here with the Community Nature Connection Training Institute. This is one of our community trainings, and we are very excited to be here for a Tongva land with Samantha Morales Johnson from the Tongva Taraha Pahava Land Conservancy. My name is Celeste Gasparic, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Training and Impact with Community Nature Connection. And I'm joining you today from Gabrieleno Tongva land, otherwise known as Northeast Los Angeles. So I'd love to hear where other folks are joining us from today. Um, if you would drop in the chat your name and your pronouns, um, if you're representing any organization today and where you're joining from and the ancestral lands you're joining from, um, go ahead and drop that in the chat to introduce yourselves. Um, little housekeeping, we have closed captioning available for this training um, and you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen to view the closed captions. Um, oh, chat is disabled. I'm going to enable the chat. Thank you for um, alerting me of that. I will go ahead and um, enable the chat right now. Um, and I want to um, go ahead and introduce Community Nature Connection to folks. So in case you're new to our organization, we are a nonprofit community-based organization serving the Los Angeles area. Our mission is to increase access to the outdoors for communities impacted by racial, socioeconomic, and disability injustices by eliminating existing barriers through advocacy, community-centered programming, and workforce development. And the Training Institute is a program of ours um, where we focus on community and certification training opportunities aiming to increase knowledge, skills, and representation in the outdoor field. So we'll begin today by acknowledging the land on which CNC operates as the ancestral unceded lands and home of the Tongva, Gabrieleno, Chataviam, and Chumash people. We recognize their continuing connection to the land, waters, and culture, and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Community Nature Connection partners with local tribes as part of our efforts to expand equitable outdoor programming to all. And I'd like to go beyond a land acknowledgement this afternoon by offering a call to action to support land back and tribal sovereignty by supporting the Tongva Return the Land Fund, which we'll hear more about today from Samantha. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of Samantha's talk. And so please feel free to use that Q&A box to enter your questions. Um, we'll get to those at the end. And I am going to enable the chat right now, and I will re-invite you to share your introductions. But um, before that, I do that, I would like to introduce our trainer. So we're very excited to have Samantha Morales Johnson here today. She is the Land Return Coordinator of the TTPC, a science illustrator and ethnobotanist. Alongside her mom, Kimberly, she started the Project White Sage digital campaign to protect grandmother White Sage. She has a BS in marine biology from CSU Pavunga and has been adapting her ecological knowledge to work with Tongva ethnobotany, sorry, the Tongva ethnobotany that she grew up with to handle advanced ecological problems that come with land return from non-native species to native species in the midst of climate change. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Samantha, welcome, welcome, and take it away. Thank you so much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be sharing um, my tribal history and my work with you all. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start the slideshow. Okay, so um, as Celeste so gratefully said, my name is Samantha Morales Johnson. Uh, Meiha, everyone, and to those of you who are on Tongva land, Meiha yo yo which um, is hello, and um, I welcome you, and uh, my ancestors welcome you. Uh, Natwanya Ne, Samantha Morales Johnson. Um, here's a little bit of um, my work. Um, I love white sage a lot, so I have a lot of white sage botanical illustrations. Um, but I am a classically trained science illustrator. Um, I got my certificate in science illustration from Cal State Monterey. And then um, as, as she said, I got my um, bachelor's in science in uh, marine biology at Cal State Havana or Cal State Long Beach. But these are my real teachers. Um, this is my family, my tribe, my relatives. Um, some of the most notable ones um, I would say would be my Auntie Barbara, who's in the um, bottom right corner. Um, uh, my grandfather, um, Arthur Morales, who um, is in that middle black and white one with the three men in it. He's, a, he's the young one in the middle, uh, not so young anymore. And uh, my ancestor, Sparky Morales, who is one of the people to revive our culture. Um, I wouldn't be here without these people. And so I have to pay homage to my ancestors and my relatives who are still here today helping um, us all work in community to do the work that we want to do with um, helping our, our native lands. So um, I would like to start off with a little bit of history, because I think traditionally we have a lot of um, knowledge behind maybe the mission system in fourth grade, and um, we don't get really past that um, in, our, uh, in our knowledge of native history. So for um, those of you who live on Tongva land, this is a little bit of our background. So our traditional lands, um, ex expand um, around LA County. Um, here's a little diagram of um, where we're at. We're, we share LA County with the Chumash, the Serrano, and the Tatavium, and then we take up a good amount of LA County and Orange County. Um, before colonization, we were um, traders and craftsmen. Um, we were very peaceful people. Uh, we used the Channel Islands um, to gather our materials and to, um, to trade all up and down the coast with um, all the way up from the Inuits, all the way down to the Aztecs and Mayans. And so um, we were, we kind of used the Port of Long Beach in a similar way that it's used now in a way. Um, we were excellent traders and um, and uh, journeymen across the ocean and um, gatherers who took advantage of the beautiful gifts that Creator has given us. Um, we lived in harmony with the environment. Um, our plants <laughs> and animals were considered our grocery store, our pharmacy, our hardware store, our church, and our school. Um, we used our indigenous knowledge to um, take advantage of the beautiful land that we were um, blessed to be, to be on and um, we're starting to reclaim that knowledge now. Uh, so, in the more recent um, in the more recent years, um, we have uh, re had Kudavanga Springs kind of return to us. It's still leased uh, from the um, from the what is it the LA School District, I believe. But the springs used to be all across um, Los Angeles. Um, I think that it's a myth that, you know, LA is notoriously dry, it's that it's been notoriously clogged up. So this is our last um, open spring, but before then we had um, an abundance of fresh water and um, fresh water plants that grew alongside it, which is what we would use for our dwellings and our basket weaving. So um, in the modern era, um, we worked in the California mission, um, the mission, and then um, from the missions we moved to the ranchos. Um, but the San Gabriel Mission continued to provide work, shelter, um, food, and community. And um, it's a very complicated history that I'm not going to expand too much on today um, because of its complications. But essentially, when we were um, indoctrinated into the mission, um, it it did, you know, make us work very hard and we were enslaved. But um, because of the systematic erasure of native people in California, it also helped us retain a little bit of our culture after California statehood. So the California missions weren't perfect. In fact, they were very far from perfect. They were very traumatic um, and our past is really complicated. Uh, we were, uh, my family comes from uh, Sabingna, which is one of the, the village closest to the San Gabriel mission. And uh, my family stayed around that area and are still in that area today. 
Um, after the missions came the ranchos and we worked as farmhands and laborers. Um, and we stayed uh, kind of assimilated with, um, with Mexican culture. However, when California became a state in 1850, um, the California governor issued bounties on California Indians' heads. So um, the statehood offered wait, 1750 for the murder of every Native American in Southern California, in California. And um, our tribe, as well as uh, all of the other California Native tribes, as far as I know, suffered under this uh, decree. Um, 1750 back then was about $300, but I still don't feel like that's enough for um, all of the horrible things that happened to us during that time. And so during our genocide, we um, went even further into our assimilation with um, the Mexican, Latino, and Hispana, um, Hispanic communities. And um, basically, hid among um, that population um, until the 1930s when we started to experience a cultural revival. Um, and that was thanks to uh, my ancestor Sparky Morales, but also um, largely to this beautiful woman here, Beatrice Alba, um, also known as B. Alba. Um, B. Alba always knew that she was a Tongva woman, um, but she didn't know much. And so she wanted to fix that. And she was the one to really um, extensively research our community from the Hugo Reed letters that were written when California became the statehood um, and bring the community together because everyone knew they were Tongva, but um, it was bad to be Mexican. It was worse to be an Indian. So they didn't really talk about it. And she was the first one to really start this discussion. Um, in the middle image here, um, we just created a, a digital monument of her very recently with um, this app called Kinfolk. And next to her is my grandfather, the one that you saw in um, those beginning slides, um, now a little bit older, um, standing next to this virtual monument of Bialva. And one day I hope that it becomes um, a physical monument of her because she was a really exceptional woman. In the 1980s, um, we had Pavangna repatriated to us. Um, here's my grandpa again um, on the left side of the, uh, on the left side, if you see, Mirror it, uh, the Gabarino Indians. Um, and then um, the little girl in the red jacket is actually my mother. Um, and so uh, Pavangna still belongs to Cal State Long Beach, but it has been repatriated. And the ancestors that um, were dug up throughout Cal State Long Beach because it was a large village um, have been returned to that land. Um, in 2019, Governor Newsom apologized to Native Americans for the atrocities that California committed. And in 2021, Mayor Eric Garcetti apologized to uh, the Tongva people specifically um, for the atrocities that happened to us. Um, but I think one of the most wonderful things that's happened to us in recent history is the land return um, just recently in March of 2022. So that is the uh, organization that I work for, and it's actually the uh, current place that I'm at, um, the Tongva Tadahat Pahava Conservancy. Um, Tadahat Pahava means the, per, um, the people's land. Um, it was created to store lands on Tobangar and um, it's uh, to help indigenous people maintain cultural practices, have space for traditional ceremony, work on language revitalization, provide housing for indigenous elders and archive community documents. Um, this is the first land that we've ever received as Tongva people. And this is specifically really special for us as um, what I would consider to be urban natives because growing up, <laughs> we always had a dissociation um, with our land and with our plants. Um, I grew up, you know, getting engaged in ethnobotany, but a lot of the times it was a kind of scenario where I would be around eight years old and um, my auntie would point out this plant at this event at a botanic garden, but we weren't allowed to gather it because we didn't have permission to from the people who owned that garden or that community space that we were at. Um, and then years later, they'd be able to find a place to gather it either, um, you know, under the table a little bit, or they'd find it um, on a, a neighboring reservation, and they would allow us to gather there. And then um, it would already be prepared on the table, and they'd be like, oh, remember this plant from two years ago? And I was like, I'm a 10-year-old kid, I don't remember. And so um, one of the things that I'm most excited about um, with the land return is now we can take care of the plants and um, teach our youth how to take care of the plants so that they can take care of, the plants can take care of them in return. Um, this will be the first time that we'll be able to fully see that growing the plant, gathering the plant process in the plant and working on the plant together um, 
as far as I know, since colonization, um, because of the way that land has been split up um, for our community. Um, this is the first time that we've all collectively owned land together um, as um, Tarahat Pahava, as the people's land. And um, I'm excited to see what will happen. Um, we have one acre of fertile oak grove habitat. Um, we have 30 coast type oak trees that give beautiful acorns. Um, it's right by um, the mountains. Uh, so we have access to further gathering space beyond our one acre and we're working with um, LA parks to um, get cultural easements to have full gathering access, which we have also not really had before. Um, we do have housing and community space available here. Um, as you can see, I'm inside of a building inside of this acre and this is one of a um, one of two and um, we have a fire circle here that um, the um, the donor of the land said that her grandparents told her that it um, was once a native fire circle and they westernized it. I don't know how true this last part is, but we're hoping that we can look further into it um, and see if this really was a place that our ancestors once dwelled on. The bad news with the acre of land that we have is um, that it does need a lot of work. Um, it's overrun with a lot of invasive non-native species, including 70 um, eucalyptus trees that are very difficult to get rid of. Um, we have um, century old pipes and structures and um, the land was also previously hoarded and we had to move. Um, so far we've had six cleanup days and over those six cleanup days, we've filled a dumpster each time. Um, many of those being the, the 40 foot long ones um, that have been filled to the brim. And so um, there's a lot of cleanup and recovery and um, funding that we need to support those things to help clean up this land. Um, and so that way we can convert it back to, uh, or return it back to our native plants. So um, our goal is to sustainably plant native plants um, over the course of a few years, um, create space for Tongva learning and culture um, to begin generational healing, um, expand land return to make free housing available to all Tongva people in Tobangar, and to expand yard return for more widespread traditional practices such as food, medicine, and cultural burns, um, hopefully in the future. So uh, now you understand a little bit of our history and, um, you know, Celeste gave a beautiful land acknowledgement at the beginning, but I feel like after the first land acknowledgement, it kind of has this feeling of, okay, I've acknowledged it, now what? Um, because the acknowledgement just kind of says the name of the people, which is important, it's the start, but um, it's not the end by far. So um, what can you do beyond a land acknowledgement other than you know, just moving somewhere else. Because I know that there are people who um, really like Los Angeles and um, I don't think that everyone needs to leave in order to make space for native people and native plants. Um, so what do you do instead? You become a good guest. Um, so uh, non-native people are considered guests on native land and um, being a good guest, hopefully um, the land will treat you as a good host if you in turn become a good guest. So uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about um, include participating in Kuyam Nua'a, um, making some plant friends and practicing lifelong learning and stewardship. So uh, Kuyam Nua'a. Kuyam Nua'a is a Tongva word. Um, it's the Tongva people's concept of a guest exchange. Um, this is a voluntary recurring contribution of individuals and institutions that can be made to support Tongva land, land uh, Tongva -led land back efforts and um, reciprocity to lands and native people of Tongar, um, which many people now call home. And so we encourage people to use um, our calculator, which we um, used from the Segorite Community Land Trust in Oakland, um, to calculate your personal or institution institutional Kuyam Noa. Um, Usually these are annual givings based on your annual mortgage or rent. Um, it's like a certain percentage, I think of like a very small amount, like somewhere between one and 10%. Um, and so you can calculate that and give according to um, your mortgage and rent and also your financial situation. Um, if you're currently facing financial housing or insecurity, please don't donate. We don't want your money if you're going to be, if you're going to skip a meal over it or if you're going to face housing problems, because I know a lot of people already face that here in Los Angeles. I know it's expensive here. So 
Um, instead, practice other ways of reciprocity other than donation if you don't feel like you can make that donation this year. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if you know anyone who might be interested in land donation um, or even the possibility of um, maybe donating their, um, their home at the end of their life, um, you can reach out, reach out to our resource mobilizer, who is Ian. And um, there's his, web, uh, his email there, ian at tongva.land. Um, all of these resources can be found on our website, www.tongva.land. Uh, we're the first people of Los Angeles. Um, my family's been here for um, many, many uh, generations. Um, but I have a lot of family members who cannot afford to live in Los Angeles. Um, even now, I feel like my family or I can barely afford in Los Angeles. Um, I feel like a lot of people feel similar. And so um, one thing that we really want to do at Tadahapahava is make sure that Tongva people don't have to leave Los Angeles anymore. Um, this first started um, during our genocide when people would migrate north to, to hide a little bit more from, um, from those bounty hunters who were after us. But this, um, this migration off of our native land continues today just because of how expensive it is. Um, I have family who lives out of state because they can't even afford to live in the state of California, let alone in Los Angeles. And so um, your Kuyam Noa'a will be a guest exchange in a way to help us welcome um, our people back onto our land because uh, many of us can't afford it. We have elders who are asking for property tax um, assistance and other things. And so we're hoping that Kuyam Noa'a and um, our, uh, our land return initiatives will help with those things. So we're also working on the Return the Land Fund, um, which is um, a, uh, how do I put this, kind of um, a way to receive back a dollar for all of the um, acres that were promised to us. Um, in 1851, the Tongva people were promised half of LA County, which is um, 1.55 million acres. And if we had a dollar for every acre promised, we could hopefully afford to live on our land again. And so we're hoping that the Return the Land Fund um, will help with all of the needs that I just previously stated, um, as well as help with um, taking care of our new land that we just received and creating a more open community space for our Tongva people. Um, if you would like to uh, donate directly to the Return the Land Fund, it is currently on our website as well. It's actually um, on the top right of the homepage um, at www.tongva.land. So um, other than Kuyam Noa'a, another way to be a good guest is native plant sovereignty. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our grandmother White Sage who is currently being poached and all of the things around that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, things beyond White Sage and what you can do to help become better stewards of the land that you're a guest on. So um, the Tongvo word for White Sage is Kasili. Um, I've also heard Sosat, depending on who you talk to. Um, I kind of use them interchangeably because I feel like, you know, we have um, words that are interchangeable all the time. Um, but um, White Sage is a very special plant to me. Um, for myself personally, I grew up with the smell. Um, the burning of white sage when I was a kid, actually, I didn't have like the best association with the, the actual burning of it because it reminded me of tribal council meetings and I was a kid and I was always bored at tribal council meetings. <laughs> and so, um, but I always loved seeing it grow and I always loved rubbing the leaves and smelling my fingers. Um, I still love doing that today. I think it's a great way to have an appreciation of white sage. Um, this is an image of me when I was about like, six or seven and my grandpa told me Mia go stand in the white sage I'm gonna take a picture of you and I'm so happy that I have that photo now because um, it just reminds me of how I've always grown up around this beautiful plant so um, white sage flowers right before summer and um, she's actually designed to sprout uh, to help her seeds sprout immediately after um, this plant like many other California native plants has naturally evolved with fire season and it can withstand wildfires to some extent and actually help um, make the fires, well, um, it helps regulate the temperature of wildfires, unlike some of the invasive species that we see today. And so um, white sage along with other native plants um, help with uh, really heavy wildfires 
And it's also um, a great pollinator plant because of its beautiful flowers. And it's also a member of the mint family or the sage family and most sages are edible. Um, this one isn't necessarily edible. Um, it's edible-ish, um, but it can definitely be used um, for very mild teas and um, it's used very often for smudging. And there's a lot of other um, medicinal benefits that we use. So um, our relationship with Kassili as Tongva people is um, being cherished as an antisept uh, and it's antiseptic for its medic medicinal properties and for its food properties. Uh, you can eat the seeds and the flowers um, if the plant is doing well. And she's cherished by tribes throughout Southern and Baja California. The Tongva people are far from the only people who have ancestrally used white sage. Um, white sage has been used um, among all of the native people of Southern and Baja California. And um, we love her very much. Um, we uh, use her to invite the ancestors into our sacred spaces and to cleanse the energy of a space. So Cassili was once really abundant in California. Um, what happened to her? Well, honestly, um, I blame Hollywood. Uh, so um, the, I also blame climate change and invasive species. Um, I think that colonization has done a lot of damage to our grandmother, Cassili. Um, we drought is causing white sage to grow thinner and lower than before. And the poaching of sage um, means that the sage is cut down to the ground before it can flower or seed. Um, we also have an incredibly uh, bad issue with black mustard, which outcompetes native species, including Cassili. Um, and so one thing that you can do to help native plants is to eat your invasives. Um, mustard greens are prolific among all of the foothills of um, Tovangar and Southern California. And it's actually a very um, delicious, like dark leafy green similar to kale. And so, um, you know, ripping these, um, these black mustard by the roots actually will help um, with white sage and even, um, even wildfires because it burns hotter and faster than native plants do because it's not adapted to fire the same way that our native plants are, as far as I know. So the poaching process, um, migrant workers are hired by a wholesaler and um, they're paid about $30 a pound um, to gather as much sage as possible with large army duffel bags. These migrant workers are absolutely exploited. Um, they're told by the wholesalers, um, hey, I'll pay you $30, uh, $30 a pound. Um, here's the plant. It's super easy to identify compared to other native plants. Just take as much as you can, as fast as you can, and don't get caught. Um, these uh, poachers will poach as much as 300 to, we've seen 1,500 pounds poached at one time. And um, if they're caught, then the sage is returned to a roster of native people who can distribute it out to um, our communities. Um, my family is part of this list as well as many other native tribe, uh, tribal community members. Um, but if they're not caught, then they're sold to uh, large organizations and small businesses alike as wild gathered. Um, some of the major organizations that still sell white sage, to my knowledge, um, are Five Below, Spencer's, and um, Juniper Ridge, which is sold through Whole Foods. Um, Juniper Ridge in particular has blocked every Native person that has asked them where they got their white sage, and Spencer's and um, Five Below just always ignore um, what's happening. And so um, most small businesses don't know what's happening. Um, most buyers don't know what's happening with this poaching, um, but we're trying to spread that awareness because it's really impacting our native environment. Um, because when a white sage plant is cut down and it's not allowed to seed or flower, what's most likely to come up is black mustard and other invasive species, which as I stated previously, um, increase the amount of, um, or the heat of wildfires and the frequency of them as well. The cultural impact of poaching is um, just as heartbreaking to, to us, unfortunately, because um, Native people in Southern and Baja California have um, gathering grounds that have stayed in their tribe or family for many generations, and we can't access them because gathering stage is now a, a federal crime. 
Um, the wholesalers get around these consequences by exploiting migrant workers, because if the migrant workers are caught, they're the ones that are uh, charged with, I believe, a $30,000 fine um, and possible jail time. And the wholesalers can say, we didn't know, we, sorry, they didn't, we didn't know what was happening. And um, they don't get any, they do not uh, get any charges pressed against them if the migrant workers that they exploited are caught. So not only is it affecting indigenous communities here, but also the indigenous communities of those migrant workers who come up from um, South America to, um, to be exploited, unfortunately, by these organizations. So um, what can you do to help? Well, um, Hollywood and um, I believe the influencer culture around health and wellness, um, I think are really um, things to be blamed um, honestly, when it comes to the poaching of white sage, they increase the demand. Um, you can see white sage in TV shows and all over social media as a play, as a way to cleanse your space, but um, that is not the practice. And so um, what I've been seeing more now is more awareness around the poaching of white sage. But um, something that I don't necessarily agree with is around um, this narrative of white sage is being poached is that white sage um, is a closed practice and it should only be used by native people. And uh, there's a very good reason for why I disagree with this. The first one is that buying white sage is not the practice. That is not the practice of saging. You're supposed to have a relationship with white sage and take care of her so she can take care of you. It's a part of reciprocal nature. Um, if you're just buying it off of a shelf, that is not a part of the saging practice at all. And so in that sense, if you buy white sage, you're not participating in the practice. You need to grow it or you need to receive it as a gift or ask for it as a medicine gift. Um, I'll talk about this more in the next few slides, but um, in indigenous culture, medicine is never meant to be sold. It's always meant to be given as a gift. So if you live in Southern California, please grow your own white sage and give it as gifts and do not sell it. Um, do not use an abalone shell. Um, abalone is also a sacred being um, to native people here in Southern California and to the Tongva people. And um, we don't like seeing it sold with white sage or being used as a, um, as a tool for smudging outside of our, our circles. So please do not use an abalone shell. Um, it's also a poached um, being in Southern uh, California and in Mexico. And um, instead I would recommend using uh, you know, a bowl or um, an incense holder or even a nice ashtray, um, just not an abalone shell when you burn white sage and make sure that you discourage other people from using abalone shells as well. Um, consider your yard return to build relationship with the original native swords of the land, which are the plants. Um, if you see vendors who are um, selling white sage, ask them where they're buying it from and maybe just kindly inform them of what's happening with white sage. Um, I think that with small businesses, uh, we need to be gracious with um, their selling of white sage because a lot of this is hidden by um, the wholesalers who sell white sage. Like I said, they sell it off as wild gathered and they do this very purposely to make it seem like it's harmless. And so the uh, small businesses that sell white sage often don't know what they're doing or the harm that they're causing. So just um, let them get them aware of what's happening with poached white sage and you can lead them to our website which is tongva.land um, slash protect white sage. Um, or there's also a hashtag that we've been using protect white sage. Um, we also have an Instagram ac account under the same name. Um, as far as large companies go, please hold those accountable. Um, like I said, Juniper Ridge has blocked every native content creator who has called them out on asking where they get their white sage. And um, I think that the only way that we're really going to get these large businesses to stop selling white sage is by social pressure. And so um, be nice to your small businesses, be mean to your corporations. That's the best way to go about it. Um, spread the word in person and on social media uh, using hashtag protect white sage. And um, if you see anything that's, um, you know, uh, very specifically, um, very popular very, and problematic on social media, um, you can reach out to us through messaging us on that Protect White Sage Instagram. <laughs> now for Yard Return, um, a hope for all Native people, plants, animals, and humans alike. So um, I heard this recently in the documentary at the end of um, this documentary called Saging the World, 
which is something that you can watch to learn more about um, the white sage poaching and um, also our importance around white sage as native people. Um, and it's the statement that native people are a keystone species. Um, for those of you who don't have a bi uh, biology background, keystone species um, act as uh, similar to the keystone on a traditional Roman gate, where if that keystone is removed, the rest of it collapses. Um, an example of this in Southern California um, is the otters. Uh, we once had sea otters here in Southern California, and they would eat, they eat about 25% of their body um, every day, which is a lot, and they would go through sea urchins like crazy. And so for um, honestly mysterious reasons that biologists are still trying to figure out, um, otters now only occupy Northern California. And when the otters left, the sea urchins started really growing in population. And when those um, sea urchins were no longer um, controlled uh, in population by the otters, they started creating um, what is called the kelp barrens because they were eating all of the kelp. Um, kelp forests are um, an essential part of uh, the, the ecosystem here in the um, Pacific Ocean in Southern California. And without otters, um, we're experiencing more and more kelp barrens instead of kelp forests. And so um, native people similarly are keystone species. Um, we uh, act in a way to take care of the land so that way it takes care of us. And our stewardship of the land is what makes us a keystone species. Um, we engage in a practice of reciprocity where we believe that taking care of the plants and animals will, take, will help them take care of us. But unfortunately, um, there aren't many keystone people left. Um, Native people only make up about 2.9% of America um, because of the genocide that we've experienced collectively in this country. And Native people only make up 1% of Los Angeles. But the good news is, is that reciprocity is a way of life, not an ethnicity. Taking care of Native plants is cultural pre -pre appreciation, not appropriation. As long as you don't try to make Native crafts, um, don't try to commodify Native plants, and give the fruits of your garden with an open hand. Um, what I mean by all of these things is, um, for example, if you would like to, draw, uh, to grow dogbane, which is a really strong cordage um, plant, you could grow it very um, well and give reciprocal, uh, reciprocally by taking care of this plant and having it take care of you. But maybe don't create you know, the, um, the baskets that native people make and try to copy our arts and crafts because that's a part of our culture. and um, trying to uh, commodify that um, or commodify our native plants is cultural appropriation. So if you would like to create a basket out of the plants that you grow, or you would like to create food out of the plants that you grow, um, maybe just adapt it into parts of your own culture instead of appropriating native culture. The other thing to do with native plants, um, if you start to, if you consider returning your yard to native plants is to give the fruits of your garden with an open hand. Um, like I said previously, medicine is not considered um, a commodity in Native culture. It's always considered a gift. And so um, with the ability to grow and store Native plants, um, giving access for people to gather and um, giving away the fruits of your hard labor with gardening is an essential part of taking care of these plants. So some of the places to get started with um, the idea of yard return. Um, is our website, tonkwa.land slash yard return. Um, the California Native Plant Society also has some excellent resources um, on uh, how to return your yard to, um, to native plants, even though I think they call it like re-landscaping or something like that. Um, but they also have great examples of these really beautiful gardens that have already been returned to native plants. Um, Terremoto is a local landscaping uh, group that we work with. Um, that we absolutely love working with that has great insight on native plants and design. Um, the Sconzo Gardens and the Theodore Payne Foundation are great stewards of native plants as well um, in a Western way. Um, they are um, they're committed to helping people grow a passion for native plants, um, whereas I think that native people are more um, towards creating a love for native plants um, in almost like a familial or friendship way. Um, but the way that they do it is also um, is also helpful because the native plants were the first people to be here. The native the plant people were the first people to be here, and any appreciation of it is something that I can appreciate and be thankful for. Um, braiding sweetgrass is also a great uh, resource for getting to know the idea of 
reciprocity um, and the uh, the honorable gather or um, the honorable harvest as uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, the author of Breeding Sweetgrass States. Um, and so I think that's a great way to get inspired of how to look at gardening and um, native plant care with a more indigenous lens. So here are your steps beyond land acknowledgement. Um, participating in Kuiam Nua'a to help support Tongva people, um, to help us return our land and return our people to the land. Um, consider returning your soil to the original inhabitants of the land, the plant people through yard return, uh, which will also return a lot of um, beautiful pollinators like hummingbirds and native bees. Um, and then if you're really ready to make a really bold step and you can, um, and you're in the place to make that bold step, um, consider land return by uh, returning your house to help us with our housing crisis as Tongva people. Um, this can happen um, whenever you're ready, which can include being written to your will. Um, we currently have someone who we are in discussion with who is going to write her house into her will um, in Redondo Beach to be given back to Tongva people. And so it can happen whenever, um, but it is a bold step. And so um, any of these would, uh, would help our community. Of course, land return being the most impactful. And I think that's it. Thank you so much um, for your listening. I hope I didn't speak too fast, um, but I um, am really uh, looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, and for folks listening out there, uh, I have been gathering all of Samantha's great resources, and I'll make sure to share those out with folks in an email after this training, um, so you know where to go um, from here. But we'll take um, the next few minutes to answer some questions. So thanks all who have um, submitted some questions into our Q&A box. Uh, we'll start with this question. Um, Thank you for sharing about the 1851 promise to give 50% of LA County um, back to the Tongva people. Do you know of a document or treaty that references this? Yes. So there are 13 treaties that were um, written to the Tongva people. Um, if you go to the Return the Land Fund page, which is um, linked to our main website, um, tongva.land, you can learn more about those uh, about that specific treaty. Thank you. And I um, will include a link to that land return page. Um, Thank you. In the email. Um, next question uh, around um, housing affordability um, and insecurity. Can you share if the Conservancy is currently working on or interested in developing affordable social housing program for Native people on returned land in Los Angeles? Um, and would you be interested in connecting with housing policy advocates and writing state policy that would enable this? Yes, so that is the main, uh, some of the main work that our resource generator Ian does. Um, he's currently working in um, getting some of those, uh, developing some of those housing opportunities for us. Um, there might even be hopefully in a, um, a future pop possibility of an apartment complex or that we could make entirely Tongva. Um, we're not sure about that, and we need funding to support all of those things, um, but thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Great, um, and they mentioned the Senka Project for Squamish Nation in Vancouver. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Yes, and yeah, and you can contact um, Ian at Tongva.land if you want to um, give, provide more resources. Um, also, we have info at Tongva.land for more general things. Great. Um, so there's a question coming in about the, um, like, Kuyam Nawa, um, as a nonprofit land conservancy with a board made up of almost entirely wealthy white residents, um, this person asks, how can they approach conservancies about Kuyam Nawa? Um, their, you know, their conservancy would not exist without donations if they don't understand the importance of land back initiatives and donating to these initiatives, um, they're wondering about like, I guess how to start this conversation, how to like 
frame it and discuss the importance of a Kuyam Nala with other lands and so thank you. It's a really great question. Um, my experience with land conservancies, um, most recently, I mean, we just acquired the land back in March of 2022, so um, it hasn't been extensive um, experience. But uh, my experience with it is that um, when conservancies reach out to us, they, um, especially land conservancies, they feel a bit of an obligation to give a Kuyam Noah on because um, thankfully we're at the point in history where people know that they need to go beyond land acknowledgement. And so I think that um, with a board of um, majority white wealthy um, volunteers, it starts with the conversation of, okay, we're acknowledging the land that we're on, but how do we make sure that we go beyond that because we need to actually be supporting native people at this point, um, especially if you're going to be um, taking care of our, of our plants and our land. And so um, I think just, uh, reminding them that acknowledgement is only the first step is probably one of the most important things to do is just to to say, you know, yeah, we've acknowledged the land. Now what are we going to do? Are we going to do something else? We probably should do something else. So just just getting them eased into the idea of that this, um, even if they've lived here their whole life, it isn't necessarily their land. They're still technically guests. And um, how to acknowledge that um, they're not just guests to Tongva people, but also to Tongva plants. And by supporting our conservancy, they're also supporting native plants. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Um, this one's about yard return. So what does yard return look like? Is it symbolic with planting native plants or is there a designation that one can apply for? Yes, so um, I should have expanded on that. Thank you for your question. Um, to me, yard return looks uh, like this beautiful picture right here. It looks like native plants return to your yard. Um, this can happen gradually over time, starting with a sage plant or a poppy plant and working your way along, or it can happen all at once, whatever fits best for you. Um, but I think it means um, returning at least part of your land to the original people, the real original people of Tovangar, who are the plants who were here millions of years before we were. And so um, this can be a progress over years. It could be a percentage of your yard that, and you decide to keep other things like citrus and garden and other like, you know, more food gardens or something like that. Um, but overall it means um, returning the yard to the respectful inhabitants of Tov Tovangar. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you mentioned a few uh, of the like local plant native plant nurseries and native plant gardens. Um, there's a question that came in: How can public native plant gardens further support Tongva community access? So we're in discussion with um, a few different gardens and thankfully their support has been really generous, which is exactly what we're hoping for um, when it comes to restoring, um, the, restoring the land and the community and the culture. And so um, that means, you know, an action of reciprocity of, you know, um, being willing to openly share um, knowledge, seeds and plants. Um, it means um, giving us access to gather um, and maybe even letting us know when things are ready to be gathered at whatever um, garden or area that is willing to um, open that space for us. Um, and it means overall just uh, being an ally who's willing to not only acknowledge that there are um, guests on the land to the plants and animals, but also um, to help us restore um, the things that we've lost because of our dark history. Um, there's a couple of questions here about volunteer opportunities. One in particular, um, there's a group of folks who work in habitat restoration and are wondering if there are um, opportunities to support the invasive species removal on the one acre property. Um, they mentioned they have access to chainsaws and other tools. Oh, that's really, thank you for that, um, for that offer. I appreciate it. Um, currently, 
We are closed to the public as a conservancy. Um, we're going to probably remain closed to the public for a bit, um, just as we continue to recover as a community and work together. Um, but uh, I really appreciate the offer. And I actually, um, if you'd like to give me uh, your contact information, um, or if I'd uh, like to give your contact information to Celeste and then they can give me, um, or she can give me your information. Um, I would appreciate that, thank you. And um, other than habitat restoration um, here on the acre of property that we own, um, I hope to see that you continue restoring habitat in other places. And um, I hope that as we become more settled in here um, on the acre of land and we continue restoring it, we can expand our work outwards um, to include larger gatherings um, of black mustard and um, you know a larger habitat restoration and hopefully eventually work to um, bring back controlled burns to Southern California, which are currently not necessarily possible because of the black mustard problem that we have. So um, yeah, I would like to work with you all. Thank you. Great, I'll make sure to facilitate that connection. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, so um, another question kind of about what organizations can do to be a good guest. Um, Long Beach Water is internally motivated to support Tongva people, but is not sure where to start. Is there someone on your team who would be interested in directing them on their role in being a good guest? I think that the best start is to participate in Kuyam Noa'a. Um, and so that would be the place to start. Great. And so I'll be um, sending the link about institutional giving um, in the follow-up email. So probably great. a great place to start there. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Um, can you share about Native objects? being returned? You talked about land return and yard return. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we are um, getting a few people reaching out asking to return native objects. We currently, uh, we recently just received um, two large grindstones um, that were um, that were uh, in a rancho in Pasadena that were returned to us and are now on Tongva land. And so um, if you have uh, cultural items like that, like grindstones or um, other things that you might believe are Tongva, um, you can reach out to me at Samantha at Tongva.land. Great. Um, and so there's a question coming in about um, about solidarity. Um, I'm curious to know, in your opinion, how can solidarity look like in practice between Native Indigenous people and Afro-Indigenous folks and the Black diaspora? Oh, I'm, I'm Afro-Indigenous. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> They're curious to know what can solidarity look like in practice between these groups? Hmm. hmm. That's an interesting question, and I think it's uh, the simplest way that I could put it is it probably doesn't look too different from indigenous solidarity, um, because uh, and maybe this is bias, or I don't think it's bias. As an Afro-Indigenous person, I see Afro-Indigenous people as Indigenous people because we are, and um, because our African ancestors were displaced doesn't necessarily mean that they were Indigenous to Africa and displaced as Indigenous people. And so um, that solidarity to me looks very similar to Indigenous solidarity, which means you know standing together um, on important issues and um, sharing as much as we're able to together. So that way we can work together to make this place better. Thank you for that um, response and thanks for the question. Um, and I think our final question today um, is about tribal and environmental group collaboration. Um, how can public environmental resource agencies 
be a better partner and work with tribes, including yours, to achieve short-term and long-term goals. Participating in Korean Noir uh, and um, giving us um, open access to gathering spaces if they're available with native plants. That's the that's the short of it. Great. Well, Samantha, I want to really thank you so much for sharing all of this information today. Um, it was really an honor to have you speak. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting all of the resources that you shared out to this large group of attendees today um, and hoping that everybody takes the next step after today's talk to do one thing to support the Tongva people and indigenous sovereignty. Yes, go participate, Kuyam uh, grow a plant or preferably both. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, thank you all for um, using your lunch hour to learn about these things. And I look forward to learning and growing with you all in the future. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Samantha. And thank okay. you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon.